Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Brian Schottlander, the university librarian here at UC San Diego. And on behalf of our library, thank you. Yes, UC San Diego is a great place. Uh, on behalf of our library, I'm very honored that you have joined us tonight to celebrate our 10th annual dinner in the library. So uh, without further ado, I'd like now to introduce our speaker for the evening, Jay Perini, the Axon Professor of English and Creative Writing at Middlebury College in Vermont. Tonight, Jay is going to share with us some observations about 13 books that changed America. Without a library and books, we're nothing, really. Uh, it's, we're garbage. And this is what we are. These, the, the, the books that are on these shelves are what matter and, and make um, our brief transition through this um, flesh um, worthwhile because uh, ideas, all right, emotions reside in the pages of the books we write and publish and read. And uh, I, I'm as much of, uh, in fact, my students are always saying to me, what do I need to do to become a writer? And I say, well, you've got to become a reader. Re reading is the essence of the thing. And it's really what I've done my whole life. I've been a reader, uh, much more than a writer. I've been a reader and uh, interested in, in, in poetry and novels and works of history and biography, uh, works of political analysis. Um, so, so to be here among, and, and just even to see the books here, it's been terrifying to think in the last few years what stresses have been on libraries with the digital revolution and with all of the kind of newfangled stuff happening. Uh, it's put a, have been a great threat to uh, writers and to readers. Yet I think we've come through, we've understood in fact, that um, it's not enough just to have a Kindle. That, that actually we need the books themselves. And it almost doesn't matter also that if, it is, if a book is on a Kindle, I mean it's, it's the work that goes into it and it's, it's the writing on the, on the page. Whether you see, the, you see it in pixels or whether you see it in, in print, a letterpress, it hardly matters. Um, so, so books will continue to exist and be the lifeblood of our culture. And uh, we will continue, I think, as a country only to the degree to which we remain a people of the book. That was referred to the Jewish nation as the people of the book, meaning the Old Testament, of course, or the scriptures. And, and, and um, I, I always say that America really is a country who are people of the book. We, we, are, we represent a very radical experiment in democracy. Uh, for the first time in, in the long history of the world, uh, people, not just uh, the ruling class, said, wait a minute, uh, we, we want not only to have a say, but we want to run this thing. And we want to vote, and we want to um, have our ideas and see them implemented, be they good ideas or bad ideas. And certainly there are a lot of bad ideas. We come up with them every day of our lives. Uh, mostly bad ideas, but no, it doesn't matter. There are ideas, even if they're horrible. And I, I think that's the great thing about this country. Even the rotten ideas belong to us. Nobody threw them at us. And so and we get to vote on them, and we get to raise our hand and say, no way, Jose. Right? That's America. Um, I was living in England um, a few years ago with my wife, and she dragged me to a lecture down the street from where we were living in North London um, by a guy called um, Lord Malcolm Bragg, wonderful Dickensian name. And Lord Bragg uh, had written a book called 12 Books That Changed the World. So I thought, well, this would be good. And it turned out they were all English books. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was amazed by that. I said, wait a minute, these are the 12, bo the 12 books that changed the world happen to be English books? <laughs> What would be the 12 books that changed America? And uh, it drove me mad. And uh, so uh, finally I switched it to 13 books <laughs> because we had 13 colonies. Idiotic way of doing the things. <laughs> but I couldn't, couldn't keep it to 12, so I made it 13. And of course, you know, you, you're ruined when you do a thing like this. You make a list of the books that shaped American culture. And what I said was, these are not necessarily the 13 greatest books that ever were published in America. That would have ruined everything, right? I would have been screwed. <laughs> so I said, no, these are 13 ground-changing books. These are books that shaped various aspects of the American mind. 
I had a lot of fun. I mean, I've never had more fun writing a book or in the discussions of a book ever in my life uh, than doing this. And I wanted to try to represent all the different aspects that were, at least that I could grab onto, of the American s situation, right? Immigrant, what's our main thing? Immigration, right? Immigration. We're, we're, I, my family were Italian Americans. They came from Rome and Genoa in 1812 over on the boat, right? They were immigrants, came through, um, you know, New York City, got their, got their papers stamped, came through the Statue of Liberty, Ellis Island, and that's the American story. Uh, we are all immigrants. And so <clears throat> I do one immigration uh, autobiography, memoir, um, but I also do, I begin my book with <clears throat> Of Plymouth Plantation mm -hmm. by Governor Bradford. I mean, these were the original American immigrants, right? They came from Holland. They were separatists. They were outlaws, religious outlaws, and they came to this barren outcrop in New England and, and established a Plymouth colony where for, a man, for many decades, from 1620 for another 100 years, they flourished with the help of the local Native American population, the Massasoit tribe, the Poconet people, and so forth, the Poconet Indians. Uh, and, and it was an amazing situation there. They were also very lucky that a man called William Bradford was their leader, and he wrote this astonishing memoir of what happened. And um, he worked on, the di on his journals from 1620 when he arrived on Plymouth Rock until 1647 when he died. Um, various people would copy down bits and pieces of his memoir, and then the book disappeared for a couple hundred years. It was, and no one knew where it was. They saw quotations from it. But in 1855, an American tourist was traveling in London, and he was in the Bishop's Library over on the Thames, and he saw in the library a bound leather volume. He opened it up. It was the manuscript of Bradford's diary. No one knows how it got there. He spent the next four months copying it out by hand, brought it back. It was finally published in, during the Civil War. Abraham Lincoln read it and said, wow, we all need a founding myth. Here we go. Plymouth Rocks, Pilgrims, the G Thanksgiving. And this was, and, and, and Abraham Lincoln said, let's make this a national holiday, Thanksgiving. And he declared this date, Thanksgiving, and says, let's make it a national holiday. It's a, it's, a, it's a commemoration of how we got along as a community, how we survived with the help of each other, communitas getting along with people. It was a great founding story. It's amazing how many Americans don't know that Thanksgiving was started by Abraham Lincoln or was a kind of a late invention. But I, but, um, I always say this is the United States of amnesia. <laughs> and basically, I always feel like, you know when you're talking to somebody with Alzheimer's, my, you know, I have endless relatives in that state and I'm going there very quickly myself. <laughs> and you know, you supply memory as you're talking to them, right? You have the conversation with this hand, but with this hand you're supplying memory. I felt with my book, Promised Land, I was on the one hand doing some analysis and the other hand supplying memory because we've forgotten so much, you know? It's rather shocking how much we've forgotten. And uh, this is a beautiful story of, of Plymouth Plantation. But it's a story of community survival and working together, and it's a story of great democracy. Um, the next book I did was one I had to do. I'm not going to go through all 13, by the way. Don't panic. Uh, <laughs> I'll just do, do a couple of highlights here. And uh, you can shout at me afterward and say, you forgot so-and-so, or how could you say that? Um, but um, I think in many ways the most central book I do is The Federalist Papers which I first read at Lafayette College in Pennsylvania when I was an undergraduate 40-some um, years ago. And it's a, it's a collection of 85 essays by three of our most brilliant Americans, right? Um, Alexander Hamilton, Madison, and um, John Jay, who was a great New York jurist. And um, <clears throat> really the whole of, I mean, think what was going on. Here we had this loose confederation of 13 colonies and uh, something had to be done. Nothing was working out. Um, we didn't really have a nation. And these, these were Enlightenment intellectuals. Our founding fathers were very lucky. They were very well educated. They were classically trained. 
They were very well read. They were in incredibly smart. And they met in Philadelphia and they forged this constitution, which by no means was a guarantee. Uh, in fact, people thought, oh, come on, give me a break. That's never going to work. It had to be argued viciously all through that hot summer in Philadelphia, right? And, um, and, and the Federalist Papers were written by these very smart people to try and help people say, come on, vote for it, guys. This is a good idea. Um, and it was a fairly original creation, the first Enlightenment democratic uh, experiment in the whole history of the world. Um, many people weren't sure it was going to work. In fact, uh, famously, I'm just going to quote one little passage in the book, which I love quoting, because uh, the eminence grise at this convention was Ben Franklin, very old, very doddering. And at the very end, he was asked to stand up before they voted. And, and old Franklin wobbled his way up to the podium, and he said to people, Listen, my friends, I agree to this Constitution with all of its faults. I'm doing a good Ben Franklin, aren't I? <laughs> if they are such, the faults. Because I think a general government is necessary for us. And there is no form of government but what may be a blessing to the people if it is well administered. And I believe further that this is likely to be well administered for a course of years, but can only end in despotism, as other forms have done before it, when the people shall become so corrupted as to need despotic government being incapable of any other. Holy mackerel mammy, <laughs> Benjamin Franklin. There were a lot of objections to these things. Franklin thought, for, it, for instance, he said, the whole, the way we're picking the Supreme Court is going to one day, he says, lead to a politicized court. <laughs> and imagine that happening. <laughs> I, I liked it that Thomas Jefferson, who was in, in Paris at the time, was not at the Constitutional Convention, was asked for his opinion. And he said, I'll vote for it, I'm all for it, but he said, just so that we meet every 20 years to have a new constitutional convention, because this is only going to work for one generation. And we must never for a second, said Thomas Jefferson, imagine that the original framers of this constitution had any prior understanding of things than we do, than people will, will in 100 years or 200 years. So it always gives me great agitation when I hear members of the Supreme Court say, well, I'm, I'm all for the original framers of the, I'm a, you know, that, that whole idea that, you know, the original framers of the Constitution somehow had access to God and therefore understood what was perfect and that we must try to construe what they meant. Well, that's the people who were in Philadelphia in 1889 understood that that was nonsense. And it remains a tremendous piece of nonsense that gets perpetrated endlessly. I move straight on to Ben Franklin. His autobiography is probably my favorite book in American literature. Uh, here is the great American, self-invented, came from nobody. Uh, his father was a soap maker in Boston. He went off, he, he slipped away from his family, no education at the age of 16. They didn't know where he had gone, he went to Philadelphia. He became uh, a great publisher, uh, a very wealthy man, uh, a tremendous character. He invented everything from the bifocals to the catheter. I mean, Ben Franklin, uh, you can't, the Europeans understood him. He was called the, the American Voltaire in France. One of the main things he invented, I say in my book, was the genre of autobiography. Right? He invented this genre. Now, there were memoirs of great kings and princes and generals, but the story of the common man who tells you how he came up from his bootstraps and invented himself, that's original to Ben Franklin. And ever after, there's American autobiography. It's the greatest stream of our writing, you would say, is autobiography. Uh, now, this is not the great books, the 13 great books. I only did I think two or three or four great books. I did, I did Thoreau's Walden because I was damned if I would do a book like this and not write about Walden. 
because it remains my favorite book of all time, a book I reread every single year of my life. Uh, I believe in, you know, he says, you know, he went off into the wilderness because he wanted to front the basic essentials of his life. And this confrontation with the natural world and the spiritual world has a depth that to me is scripture. It's, it's ongoing revelation. It's pure scripture, Thoreau's Walden. One of the other great books I did was, and because I, I could simply not not do it, was Huckleberry Finn, the great Mark Twain. I mean, this is a, another book. The, uh, there are only two books that I reread every year. I always make sure I read Walden and Huckleberry Finn. Uh, I have them practically by memory, and I just read them over and over and over. So my wife always laughs. She says, you're not starting that again. I said, here I go. And, uh, you know, Wal Huckleberry Finn, 1885, is the great American freedom song, right? Lighting out for the territory. Huck Finn, uh, the orphan who sets out on this amazing river journey. And, uh, you, know, t you know, he gets his, his friend Nigger Jim, and he refuses to sell him off. He's going to let him go free. It's an amazing story. The language is pure poetry. The spirit is as great as the spirit of any work ever written in the history of, of mankind. So I was, those, those, those at least are the two bona fide classic works that I do in this book. But otherwise, I'm looking for books that shifted how we think about ourselves. A couple of them are eccentric. One of you said to me today, wow, I was a, a little taken aback by a couple of your choices. Uh, one of them was um, Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. <laughs> Many people have questioned that. And I only did that because I do think it's one of our American things. Uh, how, to, how, to, how we create ourselves. Right, it was written in the midst of the Depression when people couldn't get a handle on how am I going to get ahead? How can I somehow make ends meet, put food on the table, feed my family, make something of myself. And so Dale Carnegie's book swept the nation and swept the world. In fact, one of the little tidbits that came across was that after Glasnost in 1889, 18 different Russian translations of Dale Carnegie's book came into print in Russia. That's amazing to me. But another book I write about that interests me still is Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uh, you know, little, um, Harriet Beecher Stowe came to the White House in 1862 for lunch with Abraham Lincoln. She was five foot two and he was, you know, six foot four. And he met her at the front door of the White House. He looked down at her and he said, so you're the little lady that started this great war. <laughs> and she was, you know. That, that's, that's the book that fired up a whole country about abolition and slavery. And what a book. I'd actually, it was the only book of the 13 that I'd never read before. So I was trying to decide whether to use it or not. I remember sitting in London and buying a book at the local bookstore. I saw they had one. I was amazed. <coughs> then it, later I wasn't amazed because it actually, after the Bible, it was the best-selling book in the world in the 19th century. Not the country, in the world. They had to keep 18 printing presses going 24-7 just in the U.S. to keep up with the number, the, the demand. And that went on for 45 years. This book sold and sold and sold and sold and sold and sold. And I wondered why. I started reading it at one morning after breakfast. I started at 8 o'clock. I finished it that night at 8 o'clock. I never got up from my seat for 12 hours. That book is Stephen King on steroids. <laughs> it's the best narrative ever written. You just can't stop reading. And it really makes you understand the devastation of slavery and, and the whole thing. And you understand why the Civil War was fought when you read that book. So that was a hugely influential book. Everybody read it. Everybody mm -hmm. talked about it. Everybody, I mean, Henry James in his memoirs, in, written in, 18, in 1910, uh, said, this was the ether we lived in, Uncle Tom's cabin, when I was a child. It was this air around us. People lived in, breathed that book. No book, no book except the Bible has more influential. By the way, many people have said to me after I've given this talk, why did you not put the Bible in this? I said, well, it's not, God was not an American. <laughs> and so, it's just not an American book. It's a great book, but, and God's a great writer. But this wasn't an American book. So these are all American books. 
Um, I do also, when I get out, I thought, well, one must, I deal with race and slavery and, uh, in various books here, in Uncle Tom's Cabin, a little bit in Walden, uh, but, but of course, I also, I, I had confronted straight on, I did one book on race, there's so many, Frederick Douglass, what do you do? I bat it my brains out. Finally landed on um, W.E.B. E. Du Bois, um, the, the Souls of Black Folk, which is an astoundingly beautiful book. And he says here, you know, race is the crucial question in America, and he analyzes it in ways that are still essentially the ways that we think about race in this country. Um, I, I really recommend it to you if you, ha if you haven't read it, The Souls of Black Folk. Uh, it was written um, in um, 1903 and very much written in tandem with, or uh, let's say in dialogue with, the 1900 book by Booker T. Washington, Up From Slavery. In many ways, the, they, I would say Washington and Du Bois framed the dialogue on race in this country. And it, what's, what's some degree shocking is how we've never gone beyond this dialogue. Essentially, the way they framed the racial divide in 1903 is pretty much still uh, the conversation that's being had in this country. So uh, it was very interesting in the age of Obama to, to read um, a great book <clears throat> like by W.B. Du Bois. Um, in the 20th century, I looked at, for example, one real, Im I want one good immigration memoir, and there are endless immigration narratives, countless ones, but I did um, Promised Land um, by Mary Anton. She was a Jewish girl from the Pale of Settlement in Russia who came to America and she kind of framed the par par sorry, paradigm of immigration. You're living in the, my grandmother used to say this to me, you're living in the terrible country, in the old country. You've got the boot of the law, poverty on your back. You can't make ends meet. You hear about this great place, America, where the streets are paved with gold. And then you make the crossing on the ship. My grandparents made it. And many die on the journey. And you arrive in Ellis Island or Boston. And you're processed. And then you suddenly realize you're in competition with all the other immigrant groups, Italians and Irish, and on and on and on. And eventually through libraries, Mary Anton says, libraries, you find your voice, you find out who you are. That was true for me as a little boy going down to the West Scranton Public Library where there was a little old lady with blue hair called Mrs. Godfrey. And from the age of nine on, she said to me, you're interested in books? I said, yes. She said, why don't you try this? I went there every weekend. The summers I was there every day. Mrs. Godfrey was my main teacher in a library. West Granton Public Library. And, you know, it was very interesting. There were very few in the library in those days. It was me sitting at one end of the table and far at the other end of the table was Joe Biden. <laughs> <laughs> My mother was Joe's babysitter. His father was a used car salesman on our street corner where I lived. So, you know, libraries matter, right? <laughs> So people get their education in these places, in little remote places all around the country. Moving up through the 20th century, we see, you know, so many books like, what would I do, what would I do? One of the books I couldn't resist doing because it's meant so much to me was Dr. Spock's Book of Baby and Child Care. <laughs> Never forget when my first kid was born 35 years ago. My mother gave me a copy of this book, and I, and I said, I can't do this. I really can't. And I opened up. It said the first sentence in that book is, you know more than you think you know. <laughs> Actually, that was a lie, but it was a very comforting lie. I moved through. I ended with, um, I did two later books. I did On the Road by Jack Kerouac. Could not do that. And I finally ended with uh, Betty Friedan and the feminist movement. I think that uh, you know, this book came out in the early 60s and it was groundbreaking and obviously one of the huge changes in American life has been uh, you know, the women's movement, um, which really got underway big time in the 70s, gathered steam in the 80s, barreled through the 90s and is still going strong, I hope, after all these years. Um, and uh, often my students at Middlebury College uh, 
uh, I was just I just had a bit of a fight with one of them two days ago. I, I said to to uh, some girl something about Sylvia Plath. We're doing a po course on poetry, and she said, "Well, I'm not a feminist, but." And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, you're not a feminist, how old are you? She said, 18. I said, you don't know the history of women in this country or this world. I said, when I started teaching this course, English Literature 101, English Poetry, English and American Poetry, when I started teaching this course at Dartmouth College 40 years ago, we did the Norton Anthology of Poetry, and I said there were 495 poets in that book. One of them was a woman, Emily Dickinson. She had three poems. And I used to say to my classes at Dartmouth, what is it with you women? Are you just stupid? Why can't you write poetry? What's wrong with the female brain? And I used to say, if I was a woman, I would have been so angry I would have burned down that college. You know, it's shocking to me, shocking. It's an inequality that is inexpressible to me, inconceivable to me as a man. And so, um, Betty, I say this in my Betty Friedan chapter. I say, okay, God bless you, Betty. You actually started pulling the veil over this thing. You said, okay, women, what is it with you guys? You've been to Smith, you've been to Radcliffe, you've been to Cornell. Can't you add? Can't you tell that in the Fortune 500 companies reported last week, 493 of the CEOs were men? Can't you add? Where are you? What's going on? I'd say something is terribly wrong still. And so this book is a radical book because it's in, this is America. And we don't take equality for granted here. We say to hell with you. We came from nowhere, and there's nobody here who didn't come from nowhere. And we're going somewhere. And all of these authors are on some very vital, formative level saying, something is wrong, and something is right. Let's try to discern what's happening here. Let's feel the wind blow, and let's shake some of these rafters. Okay, thank you very much.